Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Sarah Gell, Executive Director at World Orlando. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this co-hosted event by World Orlando and the University of Central Florida's Global Perspectives and International Initiatives Office. World Orlando is a 501c3 nonprofit established in the early 1960s and has served as the local implementer of the US Department of State's professional exchange program called the International Visitor Leadership Program, or IVLP. The Global Perspectives and International Initiatives Office was established at UCF about 20 years ago and serves as a think tank supporting a number of international programs and centers whose activities include events, speaker series, conferences, research, broadcasts, and publications, and international partnership building. Before we start, I'd like to thank the U.S. Department of State, Global Ties U.S., and the National Endowment for the Humanities, whose support made today's event possible. I'd also like to acknowledge Karen Sala, Public Affairs Coordinator at UCF, who will be our Zoom tech today and managing the chat. We've assembled a really incredible group to lead our discussion today about the history of expos in the US, the experiences of host cities and American participants, and how we can bring expos back to the US in an inclusive way that highlights our country's diversity as a strength of our democracy. Expos, also known as World Expositions and World's Fairs, are global gatherings of nations gather, uh, regulated by the Bureau International de Expositions, the BIE, based in Paris. Expos occur every five years in cities around the world. The first was held in 1851 in London. Like the Olympics, expos are festivals of culture, technology, innovation, design, and human excellence. Past expos showcase the innovations of countries, including the mobile phone, the x-ray machine, and the ice cream cone. And now to take us deeper into the world of expos, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker. Maggie Lemire is a filmmaker, oral historian, and National Geographic explorer, whose work focuses on social and environmental issues. She's been a conflict researcher, storytelling trainer, refugee caseworker, and filmmaker on projects globally. So take it away, Maggie. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. Thanks for having me, um, World uh, Orlando and Global Perspectives. It's really an honor to be here and to have had the opportunity to sort of dive into this history of global expos or world fairs. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and show you a little bit of what I learned. All right, can you all see my screen okay? So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the paper that another oral historian, Anna Kaplan and I um, wrote based on 46 oral history interviews conducted with people who participated in World's Fairs in the US and abroad. Um, and just sort of the overview is that we did these interviews over about six months from last September to this January. Um, and we focused our interviews on 30 folks who'd participated in expos within the United States. So that's Seattle, um, New York City, San Antonio, New Orleans, New Orleans and then 16 um, people who participated in expos abroad as youth ambassadors or student ambassadors. And that was in Shanghai, um, Yosu, South Korea, Milan, and Astana, which is in Kazakhstan. So through interviewing um, these 46 Americans, we wanted to learn a lot more about what it was like for them to participate, kind of what memories stood out. Um, and essentially oral history is all about meaning making. So what did this experience mean to them at the time and what does it come to mean to them over time? It's not really about the facts of the expo, but sort of how participating in this kind of global um, fair or expo shaped their worldview, the perception of themselves as an American or uh, their perceptions of other countries and other peoples. Um, and so that's kind of what we were interested in looking at. So for the, um, the, the interviews that were focused on the US expos in the four cities that I mentioned, um, Seattle, New York, San Antonio, and New Orleans, there were sort of two main, um, I guess, 
takeaways. One was sort of the, the built impacts and the second was the felt impacts. And so for the built impacts, one of the, you know, sort of maybe more known um, legacies is just the, the symbols that have been left in cities. So you can see here, there's a photo of the Space Needle. So there were some great um, innovations in building and design that happened and a lot of investment in these cities um, that was part of, of expos and created enduring symbols. Um, the expos also created a lot of revitalized interest in these cities as sort of tourist destinations and sort of helped them have a place on not only the national map, but the international map. And they kind of became known as gateways to the world. Um, there were some less positive impacts as well in San Antonio where a neighborhood and historic buildings were sort of removed and displaced to create um, the World's Fair at that time. Um, but overall, we saw that there was increased investment in the cities um, and a lot of great building projects. Um, there were also felt impacts that were really important. So as I mentioned, these cities became introduced on a world stage and the people in the cities kind of had a renewed sense of pride and optimism and felt like their city was important. Um, and that was something that people really remembered when they gave their interviews. People also talked about how participating in a US Expo helped them kind of understand that difference was less scary. And this was not only sort of in terms of their experiences with people from other cultures and countries as part of being part of a world fair, but even within their own communities because there were performers and people are coming from all over the city into the space and interacting with each other, um, you know, during different performances and parts of the exhibition. So it sort of created a, a democratized space for people to be together. Um, and that these experiences overall in the US Expos really affected people's trajectories. Um, it made them want to travel more. For people, it felt really meaningful that if they weren't able to travel, they got to have a sense of what it was like to connect to the rest of the world. Um, and it changed people's careers and lives and what they would go on to do. Um, this is a bit similar to what happened in the expos overseas in um, China, Kazakhstan, Korea, and Milan, where I think um, overall the, the experience really did change young people's lives. But to give a little bit of background, the youth ambassadors or the student ambassadors would serve um, in their role working at the expo for anywhere from three to six months. And they would do a variety of things like greet the visitors, explain the exhibitions, do sort of warm ups. Um, and they were really there every day staffing the expo and creating a really unique people to people exchange experience, which was very distinct to the US pavilion and didn't happen at other pavilions largely. Um, and this really was meaningful for a lot of the young people who participated because they had never um, had the chance in most cases to really work abroad. Maybe they had gone on some short trip or they'd studied abroad, but for them, this was really the opportunity to go back and spend several months at least and have a real work experience, not just a study experience. Um, and they were able to kind of explore family roots and connections or cultural interest, you know, it could have been because their family was Italian American and they never been to Italy or because they became obsessed with Korean um, soap operas. There were so many different reasons, but there was a great deep desire to go and spend more time in this, this other country. Um, and so it was a deepening of an interest and an engagement. And the impacts were that for a lot of the young people, it became a really critical moment in their trajectory where they would go on to engage with the country where they served for many years to come to this present day through working in that country and study abroad or international relations or business or fashion. Um, and they felt like they were proud to be part of sort of an ambassadorship of what it was to be an American living abroad and kind of representing a complicated, a more complicated idea of the US where Americans just aren't blonde and blue eyed, but come from so many different cultural backgrounds with so many different perspectives. Um, this also really helped transform young people's ideas of themselves as Americans. Um, and they kind of thought about things in increasingly complicated ways and understood um, international relations and sort of the power of people to people exchange and the difference between governments and peoples and the, the importance of dialogue. And they all really came to deeply value those things. Um, so it, it was a huge impact on each young person that 
in almost every case, they went on to continue to be involved in that country to this day. So overall, um, the people that we talked to agreed that world fairs or global expos are essential um, increasingly in today's world because, you know, with COVID and sort of the rise of fake news and misinformation, there's nothing that can kind of replace the experience of being in person and having a dialogue and a touch point with someone. A lot of these ambassadors talked about how a lot of the people who would come to their pavilions were villagers and who would never ever be able to travel to the United States. And so it was sort of the sacred opportunity to have a dialogue um, with someone and to have these conversations about critical global issues like food and climate. Um, it, all of our narrators kind of agreed that these are really important events and that um, the US presence should be more robust and even more heavily invested in moving forward and that they should really build upon the US's greatest assets, its people, its values, its innovations, and sort of share deeper stories including sometimes even our struggles, but also how as a nation we've kind of continued to persevere um, because those kind of real stories are something that a lot of people and other publics can um, find resonance in. So that's a little bit of what we found um, and I'm happy to sort of share more in our Q&A and um, moderated discussion later. Thank you, Maggie. Um... Our next speaker is Kara Snesco, and Kara, Kara is the Senior Coordinator in the International Expositions Unit at the U.S. Department of State. Um, she was the Project Manager for the USA Pavilion at Expo 2020 Dubai, and Kara also served as the Senior Advisor for the USA Pavilion at Milan Expo 2015. Kara? Hi, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for having me today. Um, I'm really excited to be here virtually uh, and to kind of piggyback off what Maggie was talking about in terms of the research done, you know, about US Expos hosted in the US previously and talk about our participation most recently um at expo 2020 dubai which just wrapped up this past march so let me share my screen okay uh so the united states uh participated uh, and built a, a pavilion for the expo in dubai uh which was supposed to open in october of 2020 but because of the pandemic was delayed by a year uh the u.s pavilion at expo 2020 dubai welcomed over 1.2 million visitors in person and almost 500,000 through our virtual pavilion experience uh and we were open from october 1st through march 31st of this year the pavilion ha housed eight exhibits celebrating american innovation ingenuity, history, and freedom. We featured four one-of-a-kind American artifacts, including a moon rock and a Martian meteorite on loan from NASA, uh, Thomas Jefferson's Quran on loan from the Library of Congress, and a full-scale replica of the Opportunity Rover on loan from Cornell University. Let me move to the next. Um, and the U.S. Pavilion is about more than just the exhibits and the building itself. Um, our Youth Ambassador Program, or Student Ambassador Program, as it's been called in the past, um, is one of our most, most important exhibits, it, and we call it the Faces of America. Um, and we were so proud this year to receive so many applicants um, from across the United States, including Florida and Puerto Rico. Uh, and we were lucky to have 75 Youth Ambassadors ages eight through 18 through 29 from 37 U.S. states and territories affiliated with 79 colleges and speaking 24 languages. Youth ambassadors are a critical component of our participation, um, and it, it's something that the United States has been doing at least as far back as the 1950s. Um, and as Maggie explained, you know, many pavilions uh, have replicated our program uh, and we saw more uh, youth ambassador type uh, young people serving at other country pavilions in Dubai than we've ever seen in the past. 
Um, and it's a critical part of our program because as Maggie said, that that people to people, the last three feet is, is critical for uh, folks from around the world who, as Maggie talked about, many of these people have never been to the United States and likely will never travel to the United States. Many of them have never met an American before ever. So this was an opportunity through Youth Ambassadors to meet an, a, a real American, a young person. Um, we really focus hard on diversity and inclusiveness. I think it's it's really refreshing to see so many visitors be able to talk to and meet an American who's speaking to them in their native language, who looks like them. Uh, I think it, it really helps drive home what America is about um, and just how absolutely diverse we are. And the youth ambassadors in Dubai did an absolutely fabulous job. They greeted over 1.2 million people who walked through the doors. Um, they also performed a variety of tasks for us, helping with events, with um, VIP visits, helping with our social media and traditional media. Um, they really helped behind the scenes, you know, pull together and, and make this kind of pavilion work. Uh, we were open from 10 o'clock in the morning until midnight, seven days a week. So it's a really big operation um, and we need, you know, as many young people um, that are willing to come and serve their country. Uh, to come and help us really put a face to what America is. And I know we have uh, at least one, maybe more than one youth ambassador joining us today. Um, four youth ambassadors called Florida home uh, with one additional from Puerto Rico. Um, many of them are from the University of Florida, Florida International University, uh, UCLA, et cetera. Um, their areas of study include international affairs, mechanical engineering, microbiology, and English language education. Um, here's a couple photos of some of our youth ambassadors uh, who hail from Florida. Um, like I said, we're, we're extremely thrilled um, that so many applied and came to represent not just their country, but their state. Um, in addition to the youth ambassador program this year, we uh, we brought over 189 performances and 39 speaking events um, through cultural performers and speakers to showcase the very best of American culture. Um, all of our events combined attracted over 58,000 attendees and our cultural performers and speakers were affiliated with all 50 US states. Um, included in that were four culinary diplomacy events, four events with the Walt Disney Company and a sports diplomacy event with the Harlem Globetrotters. Um, members from six of our different cultural performers hail from Florida, including Jazzy and the Gents. And I know we have Jasmine here to speak to us in a little bit. Um, Illuminate, Pen Masala, Two Shields Productions, the Tulane uh, University Marching Band, and the Harlem Globetrotters. Uh, so the state of Florida was well represented um, through cultural performances for sure. In addition, um, we housed a robust business program offering US businesses a platform uh, and, and an opportunity to leverage the pavilion. Over the six months, we held 175 events. Um, seven American companies signed MOUs with UAE partners. Companies launched new brands, new businesses, um, new partnerships, new ventures, um, and explored the new markets in the Middle East. Six US states, including Florida, sent trade delegations. Um, I believe Florida sent a delegation focused on agricultural export to the region um, during our Food and Agriculture Week, uh, of which the Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, attended. I want to show a quick video now. This is sort of a farewell video that we put together recapping our six month long participation at Dubai. Um, and then afterwards, I'll talk a little bit about where we're going next. So let me. Come and see. Hi, I'm Bob Clark. I'm here to welcome you to the U.S. Pavilion. 
Come and see the American dream. The USA Pavilion at Expo 2020 Dubai welcomed over 1.5 million visitors. For those six months, guests from around the world experienced our theme of life, liberty, and the pursuit of the future, which celebrated the American people, ideas, and contributions that have changed and improved lives in the United States and around the world. Expo 2020 Dubai was one of the largest events of its kind ever to be held in the Middle East. The USA Pavilion provided a unique platform to share American culture, promote mutual understanding, engage global audiences, and support international business opportunities. The United States greatly appreciates the UAE's commitment to a successful, inclusive, safe, and healthy expo for everyone. The USA Pavilion at Expo 2020 allowed us to share our American history, to promote mutual understanding, and to highlight our commitment to a rules-based international system. Thank you for joining us on our World's Fair journey. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of the future. Okay, I had a slight technical difficulty there, but I think everything worked out in the end. Um, so with that, let me talk about where we're going next. Um, so as Maggie explained, the United States has not hosted an expo in over 40 years. The last one was hosted in uh, New Orleans in 1984, in almost 40 years. Um, however, last year, President Biden um, delegated that the state of Minnesota um, would be the United States' bid to host Expo 2027. Um, the state of Minnesota put together, um, uh, the Department of Commerce put out a, a public offering a few years ago, and the state of Minnesota put together a proposal that we deemed um, was competitive um, and would provide a, a, an opportunity for, to host Expo once again in the United States. Um, this would be a three month long specialized Expo resulting in over 33,000 new jobs created and $2.6 billion in economic activity. Um, the state of Minnesota and the United States is currently in a campaign uh, competing against four other countries. Uh, and the BIE, as, as we was spoken about earlier, that's based in Paris, the delegates will convene next June to vote on who has the right to host Expo 2027. And we are extremely hopeful and optimistic that Minnesota will bring home an expo after 43 years. Um, the proposed theme for Expo 2027 is healthy people, healthy planet, health and well being for all, um, a very timely theme. And it would be the first World Fair to showcase innovations in global health and sustainability. So we very much are excited, not just for the state of Minnesota, for, but for the country as a whole. There'll be opportunities um, for every state and every city um, to plug into what would be an absolutely exciting event uh, in Minnesota in the summer, not in the winter, um, in 2027. And last but not least, um, the United States and the Department of State um, is quickly pivoting uh, along with all of our other colleagues uh, uh, from across the globe to focus on Os Osaka and Expo 2025, which is set to host uh, to begin on April 13th of 2025. The Japanese government has selected a theme of designing future society for our lives. And Expo 2025 will be the largest public and economic diplomacy event in the Indo-Pacific since 
Shanghai 2010. And the Japanese government is expecting over 28 million visitors to come to the expo in Osaka. So we are very quickly working on our internal planning um, to be able to design, build, and operate uh, a pavilion for the next World's Fair in less than three years. So um, a lot of work to be done, but we're really excited um, to continue on our traditions um, of a youth, a robust youth ambassador program in Japan, as well as a robust cultural performer program um, when we arrive in Osaka in April. So that's it. I'm happy to answer questions, but I want to be able to turn this over to our fantastic youth ambassador and Jasmine, our cultural performer. All right. Thank you, Kara. Um, our next speaker is Jasmine Gent, who participated in Expo 2020 as a cultural performer. She's an international smooth jazz and gospel recording artist, as well as an accomplished music educator. Jasmine was awarded the prestigious 2019 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Jazz Album and is a six-time Billboard chart-topping artist. So thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm so excited to be here and I'm going to share my screen really quick. Okay, can everyone see my screen? <laughs> okay, so I'm so excited. I relate so much to uh, what Kara was speaking about um, and I recognize so many of those places. Um, some of the people, which you'll see in some of these pictures, and what Maggie was saying, um, and the amazing experience um, that really has an impact, I know, on me as a musician and performer. <clears throat> so again, I do play jazz saxophone, and I'm going to show a quick video so you can see in context um, what I do. It'll be like 10 seconds. <laughs> Okay, so um, that was a, a short example of, of what I do. So it's jazz saxophone, but we mix it with other uh, genres as well. So I wanted to say my top takeaways from the World Expo and what I experienced. So one of the amazing things was being able to tell the United States story um, in my slice of um, American culture and, and what I do. Of course, jazz being born here in America and um, also, uh, you know, America's music and being able to see how we present ourselves um, as well. So I did play some songs that were popular pop songs or R&B songs or whether it was gospel or rock, but fusing that with my own music and then that being part of the bigger picture. So I was able to see how um, I played actually under the um, Space Falcon, like under the rocket. So that was an interesting experience. Um, and the great thing was seeing how the United States, how we presented ourselves to the world. So um, being part of that, and as soon as you walk into the US Pavilion, I mean, it was a very long line because everyone's interested in seeing that. And you saw Abraham Lincoln, you saw um, like the Statue of Liberty, you saw all, all these different things that we are so proud of um, here in America. So it was amazing to be part of that. And I do want to speak how awesome it was to see the other countries. So if I'm speaking correctly, I believe there were 193 countries um, that were represented. <laughs> so as you can tell, I, I didn't get to go to every single one of them because I was having to play as well. Um, but from visiting some of them, um, you were able to see like the history of this country. You were able to see current projects um, that are taking place. Um, and also experience their culture, whether that be um, through food or I remember going in the India um, 
pavilion and someone is doing yoga and you just stop what you're doing and you start you know doing yoga as well and that was so much fun and the interesting thing is the impact that the united states had on other countries and the influence they had um i remember um the italy pavilion there was this this jazz band and it was uh, awesome they were playing like swing music they were playing second line you know feel or music that you would hear commonly in in new orleans and it was great to hear the influence that United States had there, or even at the um, Spanish pavilion. You know, not only were they playing music from their culture, but all of a sudden they were performing, you know, Michael Jackson. And it's just like, you know, this is, this is awesome um, to see that. Um, I was able to see how other countries also positioned um, themselves. Uh, so for example, um, Russia, uh, if, if you went to the, the Russian pavilion, they were inviting people to come, inviting um, tourists, like saying, hey, please come here and, and, and be Russia. And this was despite um, the Ukraine invasion. So you just see that it's great to see, again, the world as a whole, the connection that we have amongst different countries. And I, I do believe it's a life-changing event. And when we were talking about the um, youth ambassadors, being able to speak with them, I actually, because they were guiding us different places, but being able to ask them like what their interests are in life and how this has changed um, their lives and touched their lives as well. So I truly enjoyed that. I want to show some pictures. I don't have as many pictures as I'd like of myself performing. Um, so I'm going to show some of the pictures I was able to take while, while I was there. So we have the infamous um, Burj Khalifa right here to the left. Um, we did ride camels, we did a whole desert safari. And to the far right, um, there would be a screen that was right in front of the US Pavilion and it would show like the times of performances and um, where it was located. Um, here we have the musicians and of course the mass, you know, this being postponed um, due to COVID, we were getting COVID tested every day. So each time you're just like, okay. <laughs> No, everyone's safe. Thankfully, none of us um, actually contracted um, COVID during that time, um, and which was great. We were there seven days. So, and this was in February. So, as I said, you see what took place in the U.S. Pavilion here with Abraham Lincoln. Have to have a picture of a camel. And here's all the, the musicians here. Um, this is one of the sooks. Um, and one of the markets there in Dubai. This is us right outside of the U.S. Pavilion and outside of the US Pavilion sign. And this line was, was often you know, very long. So um, it was, again, great pride in our country. And then you just saw Bob Clark in um, the video that Kira shared. And this is us um, in a picture with uh, Bob Clark. So again, it was an awesome experience. And if there's any additional questions about um, my experience with uh, from a cultural performer's perspective, um, Feel free to type them in the chat. Okay, thank you, Jasmine. <laughs> that was great. Um, our next speaker is uh, Paige Lebel, and she participated in Expo 2020 as a youth ambassador. She was one of 75 Americans in their 20s from more than 37 states and DC to be selected. Paige is a recent graduate from Purdue University, where she studied electrical engineering and completed, competed on the Division I soccer team. So Paige, let's, I'm, we're excited to hear from you too. Awesome, yeah, thank you everyone for sharing your stories and thank you, Sarah, for the great introduction. As she said, my name is Paige Liebel. I am from St. Petersburg, Florida, so I'm a Florida native. I was a youth ambassador at Expo 2020 Dubai. There were 75 of us in total, but they split them into three cohorts. So 25 were there just for three months um, in, the, in the fall, and then another 25 in the spring. But I was part of the cohort who was there for the whole time. So I got to see Expo from the very start. Actually, we got in about two, three weeks before Expo opened. So when it was still truly a construction site, there were like cranes overhanging on our way to the, way to the pavilion. And, uh, and then I got to see it all the way through until the very end. Um, got to walk the expo grounds after expo closed when it was a ghost town again. So it was very cool to get to see the whole progression. I too have some photos um, to share of my time there. Let's see. 
Okay. So this is the whole group of us, all 75 of us um, at the DC launch event. So it was the only time all 75 youth ambassadors were together about four or five days um, before 50 of us got sent off to Dubai and the other 25 would meet us um, in January. In this group, um, you're gonna see some Fulbright scholars, um, some Pickering fellows, definitely future foreign service officers. Uh, so about half of them were very involved in international affairs, um, studied poli-sci, very interested in the public sector. Already some of them are back working in DC and in all different departments and things like that. But then there were about half of us who had really no connection to the public sector before becoming a youth ambassador. Um, the half of us who had no connection mostly found this job through an Instagram ad. Um, I myself included found, found out about the Youth Ambassador Program through Instagram and I was like, oh, what is this? What is the World's Fair? I've never heard of this before. Um, and I applied and then heard back from Global Ties a few months later. Um, and for some of us, um, myself included, we have a fairly extensive travel history, um, very comfortable in countries abroad. Uh, but a lot of them, it was their first time actually leaving the country. So some pretty brave young people leaving leaving their homes, leaving America for the first time, headed over to Dubai for an extended period of time. So that was that was pretty cool. Um, so what did us as youth ambassadors do? As you heard, we were the faces of America at the USA Pavilion. Uh, we showed guests to the pavilion. We uh, helped cultural performers around. You know, the, the cultural performers like Jasmine would come in for three, four, five days, have to perform at stages all around Expo. Um, and we were their guides to get them to and from their stages. Um, we participated in panels. People spoke on, you know, indigenous peoples panels, sustainability panels. Um, we had a very diverse group of people with lots of different um, specialties, right? We had a, a, NASA, a NASA scientist, Vivian, um, she studies at, at Stanford. And so when NASA representatives came through, she was the point of contact as a youth ambassador. She had um, experience with NASA. Uh, other things that we did like at Expo, as you can see this picture on the left, that's at the city rocket stage. So underneath the, the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket there, I'm on the kind of left corner in the mask. I've got to take off my mask. Um, that was a flash mob that we threw um, on Halloween to, we're all in this together uh, with High School Musical. And that was, that drew quite a, quite a crowd. Um, the picture on the right is an example of us competing in a U.S. Naval Base sponsored cornhole tournament or bags. I don't know, where, wherever you're from in America, you call it a little bit different. Um, we didn't represent the States very well. We actually lost the tournament. I think Thailand ended up winning. So all that tailgating experience in college didn't pay off for us. Um, but it was really fun to bring in maybe like 15, 16 different countries, have them interact with actually U.S. military folk and then us and introduce like a fun little cultural experience for them. Um, we also did things outside of Expo. Like we went to an art festival in Russell Khaima, which is one of the neighboring Emirates. Um, and the people who are hosting the art festival were just so excited to see these Americans, you know, drive pretty far out of their way, get to share their culture with us um, and their beautiful artwork with us. Um, we went to, we accepted tickets, like me and a few other youth ambassadors accepted tickets from the Russian Russian uh, pavilion to go to the world hockey, like the world cup. Um, so it was a bunch of young Americans with some Russian diplomats chilling and watching hockey together. Um, things like that kind of was, it was, they were constantly happening. And US youth ambassadors were always taking advantage and representing the states there. Um, this is a picture of closing day of Expo. Uh, this is the pavilion staff. So you can kind of see us interspersed in white shirts and those red bomber jackets. Those are the youth ambassadors, but it wasn't just the youth ambassadors working at the USA Pavilion. We had a large food and beverage staff, commercial, like real, uh, the um, gift shop staff and uh, our bosses, all of those people, most of them were not from the US. Uh, they were from Africa, Southeast Asia, our direct bosses were French, Chilean, South African, Tunisian, um, Indian. So the people who youth ambassadors are actually directly working with even, um, for some of them, it was the first time ever working with an American citizen. And as I believe like Maggie and Jasmine and the other speakers were talking about, 
being a youth ambassador was, I mean, just like the epitome of that last final three feet of public diplomacy, soft diplomacy, as we called it. Um, there's so many people who walked through those doors where we were the first Americans they were ever meeting. Um, it was also wonderful to see my fellow youth ambassadors really break some stereotypes for those people. Um, for example, like Jesus, um, one of the youth ambassadors from Southern California of Mexican descent. I mean, he got it all the time. It was fairly offensive, but people would be like, you're not American. And he'd get to correct them and tell them that, no, I'm, I'm in fact American and I'm here representing my country. Um, other beautiful little memories that I have was, I remember working in the rocket garden and this, oh, she must have been a 75, 80 year old Italian lady came like dancing down the ramp because the music was, you know, of her style. And she, she grabbed me and we did like a dance for like five minutes together. So I had to dance with this little Italian lady who spoke no English whatsoever. Um, or the number of times that I was working and it would be right at like the Mars Rover. Um, so one of the last exhibits someone would see as they're walking to the pavilion and a little kid would be running into the room being like, oh my gosh, NASA space. And they'd be so excited because it was the first time ever getting interacting with uh, like space exploration. And then I'd get to like lean down and ask them, hey, do you want to touch the moon? And they would just light up when they'd get to be like, this rock is really from the moon. Like we get to touch a lunar sample. And so just all those shared experiences were just really wonderful. Um, I had no idea really what World Expo was. I didn't know they were still going on before I started um, as a youth ambassador. But now as I'm you know, sitting back in America, I actually just came back from a little reunion in New Orleans with some other youth ambassadors. Um, we all look back on it thinking like, wow, what a wonderful way to start our young careers, start our young professional careers. Because I mean, it is just so optimistic and so international, um, you know, and you, you, you become proud to be an American while you're there. I know that sounds so cliche, but a lot of us young folk, patriotism is often tied with uh, nationalism and there's a little bit negative connotation with patriotism, but I think all of us discovered that you can be truly patriotic while still being a global citizen. Um, so yeah, I just really wanna thank everyone who threw on Expo and that's about all I have to share. Thank you, Paige. That was fascinating. Um, we're going to start our panel discussion. So I know many of you have questions. And um, so to moderate that discussion, I'm going to turn it over to Shilpa Finnerty. Uh, she's a senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Human Trafficking and Modern Slavery. The center is an initiative of the Global Perspectives and International Initiatives Office at the University of Central Florida. She's, Shilpa is also an adjunct professor at Rollins College and a project manager at World Orlando. So I will turn it over to Shilpa now. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your contributions to our discussion today. It was so interesting and I loved seeing all the images and I'm really jealous and I would love to attend in the future. Um, since Paige just finished, I actually wanted to ask a follow-up question for her. Um, we're addressing a UCF audience and I thought, you might be able to provide some information on how we might learn more about how to apply if there are any students in the audience and um, i know there are professors in the audience who might refer their students to the program oh yeah so osaka 2025 is right around the corner um any anyone who's a student right now could definitely apply for that uh, i believe the application cycle is usually like a year a year and a half out um before the event starts and yeah i would just keep an eye out on the U.S. State Department website. Um, I don't know if Global Ties, um, who is the one who ran the event, uh, or ran kind of the youth ambassador interview process uh, for Dubai. I don't know if they're also doing it for Osaka, but yeah, I'm guessing that you can just type in to Google about a year and a half before Osaka, you know, youth ambassador U.S. 2025, and, and you can start the application process. I see Kara is nodding, so I think that's correct. <laughs> yeah, no, um, that's absolutely right. We um, are in the process of working through our Osaka planning. We will absolutely, without any certainty, I can say we will have a robust student ambassador and youth ambassador program. Um, we are expecting to start with recruitment perhaps about a year, maybe a little bit more than a year out. Um, 
you know, the program might look a little bit different. Um, you know, Dubai was a very international destination. We had, you know, 24 languages represented. Um, Japan, as, as many of you may know, you know, most people in, in Japan don't speak English. Um, and so the language barrier is something that will be much different for us to overcome. So we will certainly be recruiting uh, young people who have Japanese fluency um, and perhaps, you know, Mandarin and Cantonese and some other um, Southeast Asian language fluencies. Um, that doesn't mean that if you don't speak those languages, you know, that there's no opportunity for you. Um, but that's, you know, we will, the, the program will be slightly different, you know, based on the language um, capabilities that we'll be seeking. Thank you. I'm going to try and get to the questions that were submitted in, in the chat since um, we're running a little behind schedule. So we had a question in the chat um, that asked, is the USA going to have to rely on the host government to pay for our pavilion as the US, uh, as the UAE did at future World Expos? So I, as the uh, resident diplomat, I'm happy to take that question. Um, so unfortunately, the United States, as of 1994, um, due to a, a legislation that was passed in Congress, uh, we depend on donations to fund our presence at World's Fairs. Um, the United States is the only country in the world entirely reliant on donations for its participation. Um, and so in the past, we've had to rely on corporate sponsors and fundraising entirely. Um, and for the Dubai Expo, um, you know, uh, there was an attempt made to fundraise. However, um, participation at expos is, you know, it, it involves, you know, designing and building a, a 40,000 square foot building. Um, and so unfortunately, uh, due to the legislative restrictions and due to, you know, a variety of reasons around fundraising and the challenges, um, the United States did rely on the government of the UAE to build the building and they also gifted us um, funds to cover the exhibition and cultural programming. Um, this is not a sustainable model and it's not one we're expecting <laughs> to happen in Japan. Um, the president's uh, budget that was put out last year um, and the budget request that was put in for this up upcoming fiscal year um, does uh, appropriate funds for our participation in Osaka. And we are extremely hopeful and have many supporters in Congress um, that are working towards a legislative solution so that we will never again um, have to rely on donations. Uh, so we are not planning to rely on donations for Osaka. Um, we are uh, continuing to work towards uh, a model that would allow us to use uh, government funds, uh, at least in part um, for our participation. I might just throw this on to the same question. Um, it was in the same vein. It asks, what is the return on investment to the US for the cost of participating in an expo? So, I mean, I think there's there's two parts to this, right? There's the um, soft power component, which is vitally important um, as both Jasmine and, and um, I totally just blanked, and Paige um, talked about you know, the 1.2 million people coming through the doors, most of them have never been to the US and have will never be go to the US. And in an age of, you know, rampant disinformation across the globe, um, and, you know, a, a reemergence, especially in sort of Russia and China and, and disinformation coming out of those countries, I think it's critically important um, that the US participate in these events and participate in a way that allows uh, millions of people to see for themselves, you know, what America is and is about. Um, I think, you know, the Youth Ambassador Program, the Cultural Performer Program, certainly addresses many of these stereotypes and disinformations that exist in the world today. Um, but so does the exhibition. Um, you know, America uh, in Dubai was, you know, our program was really talking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of the future, and how American freedom, you know starting as far back, you know, as the founding of this country, focused on freedom um, and individual rights. And that freedom has allowed for um, generations of innovation um, and life-changing technologies. You know, we, we, we uh, an, America, you know, founded the telephone 
and then fast forward 100 years and founded the mobile phone. Um, and America continues to lead in the innovation space. And I think, you know, in this age of, of kind of struggles over democracy um, and disinformation, it is critically important that we be there from a soft power perspective. Um, in addition to that, as I talked about, uh, many, many US companies and states leveraged our pavilion um, to increase business um, in the region, to increase partnerships. Um, the state of Florida, as I said, sent um, a rather large agricultural uh, delegation hoping to increase agricultural exports to the region. So uh, in addition to the soft power um, components, there is a critical opportunity for American businesses. Um, and many of those took advantage, even given COVID and all of the you know, uh, challenges around that. So I would say the return on investment is sort of twofold. There's an economic return on investment, um, as well as a, a more kind of soft power return on investment. Thank you. Um, Maggie, I have a question for you. We'll go back to you, Maggie. In your research, you mentioned uh, your, your survey of 46 narrators in your oral history that you did. Uh, what did they all tend to want to see changed about future representation at expos? Did you see any commonalities in that? Yeah, that's um, a great question, and it can build off a little bit of what Kara um, was sharing. I think that one very um, obvious commonality was they all want federal investment and federal funding, um, just because they all felt like it was a vitally important exercise and well worth the return on investment, considering, you know, the different types of things that our government spends money on, even if it's harder to quantify. Exactly. Um, they felt and knew inherently that it was a very important and worthwhile exercise. And I think the other side of that is some of the youth ambassadors felt uncomfortable with sort of the corporate presence at times. Um, and another side of that as well is that they really wanted to be able to continue to have the, the really robust, you know, youth ambassador and cultural performer program and to be able to kind of engage in the really critical dialogues and questions of our time, people to people. One of the things that I was really impressed by when I talked to the youth ambassadors was they had these roles, but they were really encouraged to actually have meaningful interactions where they got to share their own opinions and perspectives, of course, diplomatically, and they were trained for how to do that. But they want these um, venues, I think both the people who were part of World Fairs in the US and youth ambassadors abroad, to be spaces where people from all around the world come together to talk about our common challenges, like climate change, like food security, um, all of the things, and to really explore not only you know innovation around those things, but perspectives on what solutions look like and how different communities are facing that. So, I think you know the other big thing is just leaning into having those critical conversations and spaces of exchange and into the hard kind of questions and, and things that we're all solving like missing or challenged by like misinformation. So those were some of the things that I heard people wanted. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to Jasmine. Jasmine, uh, we got an interesting question um, from a participant uh, when they registered asking what is a cultural norm that you observed during the World Expo that the US would benefit from adopting? So is there something you saw like a practice that we might benefit from? I think we're all aware of, of this benefit, but I think, uh... I think this is growing more, but learning other languages, um, because so many people, um, even from other countries, um, it may be encouraged for, for them to speak English. And I think sometimes that can be challenging um, in uh, the United States, even though we are ever evolving. So I, I think that's uh, um, something that we can grow in even more. Definitely. I could ask the same question of Paige, if there's something that you saw similarly. Yeah, I think a, a language barrier, um, you know, if you're able to speak someone's language, because almost everyone who comes to Expo or who interacts with an American um, in the business setting, most of those people have had the opportunity to learn English and speak it fluently. But the times when you can meet somebody with their own language um, and have a conversation with them and that just breaks down some barriers. Um, and we saw that time and time again, how 
how wonderful it was. Like I speak German. I was the only ambassador who spoke German and I like, you know, if there was even an incident, um, you know, we had a, somebody, you know, faint, had a little medical emergency. Um, and I got to be there and help, you know, helped her through the process. Um, she's a German speaker, helped her through that. And the, yeah, just the, the beauty of being able to connect with someone in their own language. I think I'm not, I'm not enough Americans um, understand that. So we're running down on time. I see one last question in the chat that just popped up. So I will ask it to Paige and Jasmine. Do your friends envy your experience or think you were crazy to spend so much time abroad last year? Jasmine, do you wanna start? Well, <laughs> I was there seven days. So um, I, I think um, in comparison to, to your experience, Paige, you were there for how many months? But I, I, I think many people ask a lot of questions because like we've all said, many, there are, there are some, that um, may not get a chance to travel um, internationally. So I'm very thankful um, and blessed for that experience and encourage people to just go and, and visit Expo. You don't necessarily have to be a performer in order to um, gain that experience. Um, and I had, a, I had a mix of reactions. Um, I'll never forget like last year in graduation. So, so spring of 2021 in, in Indiana. Um, one of my really good college friends, her parents actually sat me down and said, like, are you sure you want to go to Dubai? Um, and I just kind of giggled. I mean, I, I mean, I talked to them nicely. I was like, yes, I think I know what I'm doing. I'll be fine. Um, you know, I had the, that type of reaction. Um, and then I also had the reaction of, you know, I got there and there was these 75 other Americans, plus all the other youth ambassadors and all these people from other countries, right? And all these people who came from all over the world um, and that culture of just uh, like travel and being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Um, so yeah, there was a mix of people thinking I was crazy and then hung out with, you know, thousands of people who had the exact same mindset as me. So it really kind of showed both ends of the spectrum. Well, thank you all so much for your comments and your time today. Thank you for everyone who joined us as well. This was a really fun conversation. I really enjoyed hearing everyone's stories and hearing more about the research and the planning that goes into these expos. Um, on behalf of World Orlando and UCS Global Perspectives and International Initiatives, I just want to say thank you again. And Thank you for being great citizen diplomats, as we say in World Orlando. So everyone, please enjoy the rest of your afternoon and um, goodbye. <laughs>